Hi everyone! In this much requested tutorial, I'm going to show you step by step how to create a panorama. In general, what you need are several individual photos that you will later stitch together using 3D Vista Stitcher 4. So accordingly, the first part of our tutorial will be on how to take these photos, while the second part will be on how to use the software. It's really easy. Watch this once, practice a couple of times and you're good to go. Quick recap. What is a panorama? A panorama is the result of stitching multiple photos to get one single image that covers a wide field of view of up to 360 degrees horizontally and 180 degrees vertically. For this stitching process, you merely need 3D Vista Stitcher 4, a software that automatically merges your photos. Should you want to display your panorama spherically, rather than in a flat format only, you should have a look at 3D Vista Virtual Tool Suite. Please keep in mind that 3D Vista Virtual Tool Suite already contains Stitcher 4, so you do not have to purchase Stitcher apart. Before using the software though, you need to take your individual photos. Here's how. For a full 360 degrees panorama, you need to capture every single spot in your surroundings with your camera. Depending on your lens, this will require more or less photos to take. There are a couple of things that you should remember when taking the pictures for your panorama. Basically, you can use any camera and any lens, whether it's a DSLR camera or even a mobile phone. Nonetheless, there is some equipment that will make your life a lot easier. A common problem in panoramic photography are so-called parallax errors. They are misalignments that occur whenever you're not rotating above your camera's optical center or no parallax point. This makes it seem as if objects in the foreground had moved in relation to the background. Note how after rotating the camera to the right for taking image number 2, the tree doesn't cover the building's door anymore, but rather seems to have moved to the left. It's the same effect that you get from holding up a finger and switching between closing your left and your right eye. When stitching these images together, the object will appear twice, an error that cannot be eliminated by panoramic software. Therefore, especially in small rooms or whenever you have objects in the foreground and the background, it is essential that you find the optical center or nodal point of your lens and rotate exactly above it. This is easiest to do with a fisheye lens and a pano head. A fisheye lens covers a wider field of view than a conventional lens and thus requires taking less photos for a full turn. And less movement of the camera usually means less error sources. To really take advantage of a fisheye lens, you should mount your camera on a pano head and the pano head on a tripod. In fact, the pano head is what helps you make the lens's nodal point rather than the camera body pivot around your tripod. Depending on your camera, your lens and your pano head you'll get a different nodal point. To find yours, consult your Panohead's manual, which tends to bring a list of camera types and their according Panohead coordinates, or head over to our tutorial on how to calibrate your personal no parallax pivot point. Don't worry, you only need to figure this out once, take a note of the coordinates or place a stopper, and then always bring your camera to that same position on the Panohead's rails. This does not generally exclude other equipment from being adequate. Like I said, it really depends on the scene and the situation that you're capturing. If objects are far away, for example, it does not matter as much if you didn't rotate exactly above your camera's nodal point or no parallax point. In that case, you might be perfectly fine using almost any kind of camera and lens, even without a pano head. As soon as objects are closer to your camera, however, you should do anything to avoid changes in perspective between the individual shots. In general, and no matter what equipment you use, the individual photos should overlap by approximately 20 to 25 percent. This means that those photos that are next to each other in the panorama need to overlap by 20 to 25 percent. Contrary to what you might think, having way too much overlap is as bad as having too little because it might produce ghosting or other stitching errors. A good rule of thumb is that no single object should appear in more than two photos. So let us have a look at the different scenarios of equipment and how you should take the pictures depending on what devices you have. Let us start with the most simple equipment. 
Let's assume you only have a point-and-shoot camera or even just a mobile phone. What you do is you select your camera's portrait mode to have a wider vertical field of view. You hold steady and you start spinning clockwise around your rotation axis. When taking the individual photos, make sure that you have an overlap of about 20%. Don't stretch your arms. Keep them as close to your rotation axis as possible to avoid changes in perspective between the individual pictures. So in case you have a tripod and a DSLR camera, the process will be much quicker, easier and more accurate. What you do is you set your camera again in portrait mode and you repeat the process explained before. You rotate the head of the tripod, taking the individual photos. Again, make sure that between the individual photos you will have an overlap of about 20%. Okay, so in the best case, you have a tripod, a panel head and a DSLR camera with a fisheye lens. The panel head will help you improve your results in two ways. First of all, it makes sure that your lens is directly on top of the rotation axis so that you avoid changes in perspective between the individual photos that you're taking. So when mounting the camera on the panel head, make sure that your lens really is on top of the rotation axis, not in front and not behind. Secondly, the panel head helps you in indicating up to which point you have to rotate the panel head with the camera. Depending on what fish eye lens you have, for a full panorama it can take you between three and eight pictures. So you rotate up to the first click, you take the picture, you rotate again, you take the picture, you do this the whole way for a whole turn and if you want to complete your panorama you can also take a picture of the ceiling at the very end. Okay, so much for the theory. Now let's create a panorama together. Obviously I start off by mounting my tripod. When shooting outside, make sure to adjust the legs so that everything's straight. Your tripod usually comes with a little connector plate that is on the very top of the tripod and that serves to attach your camera to the tripod. Take that off the tripod and attach it to the bottom of your panel head. Now place the panel head on your tripod and make sure everything is secured and fixed. If necessary, adjust the tripod to make sure everything is straight and upright. Next, I grab my camera to which I already mounted the fisheye lens. Take off the lens cap and very importantly, yet often forgotten, any lens hood or ring that might limit your field of vision. Then I mount the camera on the panel head with the larger part where you would normally hold the camera up. This way you can later take a photo upwards without the camera body choking against the tripod. As I explained before, make sure to mount the camera in such a way that the lens is exactly on top of the rotation axis so that it does not move when spinning the panel head. I usually orientate on this small golden ring, trying to bring it exactly to the middle of my panel head's horizontal bar. Double check and if necessary adjust the tripod head so that your level's bubble is centered and your camera is straight vertical. Now this is what the whole construction should look like. I suggest you place your belongings under the tripod to avoid it showing in any of the pictures or to spare you the hassle of having to move things between shots. In fact, I highly recommend you taking the individual photos of one panorama straight in one stretch as this minimizes the chance of things moving or changing in the scene. Once everything is mounted, the last thing I do before actually starting to shoot is to set up my camera. This really all depends on personal taste, so try to take this as a guideline only and feel free to play around with settings on your camera until it gives you the panorama you like best. First I set my lens on manual focus to make sure it maintains the same focus throughout the panorama series and won't refocus between shots. In order to avoid changes between the individual pictures, I then choose exposure and aperture values that will be maintained throughout all shots of the panorama.
If possible, try to maintain the ISO value at 100. Or as low as possible, really. If it's a very dark room, you could, however, increase it to about 400 and remove the noise later in a photo editor. In a panorama, you usually want to have both close and far objects focused. This is why your aperture value should be fairly high. In our case, we set it to f22. This will obviously reduce your shutter speed, so you might also want to set a shutter timer to minimum 2 seconds in order to reduce vibrations provoked by pressing the shutter release. I recommend that the first photo contain both areas with a lot and little light, so it won't be the most luminous nor the darkest of the series. So I arrange my camera accordingly, and before actually pressing the shutter, I manually focus so that everything is sharp and keep this focus for the whole series. It is important that you not touch it again or refocus in between shots. Then the moment of truth has finally come. I press the shutter release and with a delay of 2 seconds the camera takes the photo. I then rotate the tripod up to the click or resistance and take the second photo. For the equipment I used you could be fine taking 4 horizontal shots and 1 up. I for myself however found 6 horizontal and 1 up to work better for me. Like I said, these are tips and guidelines. So simply try to find your most comfortable way and then stick to it. A couple of things to remember. Try to stay out of the photo, which is actually much harder than it might seem when using a fisheye lens. Once you manage that, make sure your image doesn't reflect in a mirror or window. And finally, I usually tend to step back from the camera a little bit to avoid having my shadow appear in the photo. Finally, and without having to rotate again, I take one picture up. Therefore, I bring the lens to face the ceiling, though not quite perpendicular to the floor. Press the shutter release, and since this lens covers an angle of up to 180 degrees, you might want to duck a little bit. Throughout the whole process, make sure that you are not touching or moving the tripod. So especially when walking around the tripod, try not to kick it. So that's it for the photography part. Congratulations, the hottest job is done. Now you simply take your photos, 7 per panorama in my case, import them to your computer and let them magically be stitched together by 3D Vista Stitcher 4. I will just quickly lead you through the software because it is fairly easy to use. Should you wish to see a more detailed tutorial on it though, click on the link and discover all features, functions, tips and tricks. So first of all, we open 3D Vista Stitcher 4. Select single panorama and normal panorama. And now I select the type of lens that I was using when shooting. In my case, it was a circular fisheye lens. This makes the browser window open up, where I will navigate to where I stored the photos. I select my seven photos and click on automatic stitching. And now basically the program does the job on its own. There we go. I automatically receive a lower quality preview of my panorama, which, when you took the pictures correctly, tends to turn out perfectly. This is simply so I can see how my panorama would turn out before actually stitching it in high quality. I can now enhance the panorama with these controls on the right. Or set exportation sizes. Finally, I click on stitch and save, give a name to my panorama and wait for the high quality panorama to be stitched. And we're done. Now you can have a look at your high quality panorama.
Remember that even though you can check your panorama in a 360 degree viewer, 3 Vista Stitcher only allows you to export the flat panorama. For exporting this immersive or spherical 360 degree panorama, you need to use 3D Vista Virtual Tool Suite. Keep in mind that Virtual Tool Suite already carries 3D Vista Stitcher 4, so you would not have to purchase Stitcher apart. And that's already it! I really hope this tutorial made the whole process a little more clear. Thank you for watching!